first, I'm so excited to just have been invited here. This is my first time in Iowa and it's freezing. <laughs> Hence, I, I wasn't supposed to have this sweatshirt on under this suit, but I actually have a shirt on with amazing names of black feminists you should all know, but I'm gonna zip it back up. <laughs> But it's cold as hell, so I'm gonna. <laughs> I've been texting all my friends, like I've never felt anything like this before. Um, <laughs> the other thing I'll say, here's the book, um, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. And while it's been, you know, it's a notable book on the uh, um, New York Times list, I'm most proud that people said I'm squatting like little Kim on the photo. I don't know if you, <laughs> I mean, I may, be dating, I may be dating myself here with that one. So I, I wrote this book because I was really interested in exploring what it means to come of age as a black boy becoming a man, a black child becoming a human person, any age of hip hop, any age of AIDS, any age of neoliberal political policies that were coming out of the Reagan era, and so much more. And what it meant to sort of come of age and understanding oneself as a black boy in a city like Camden, New Jersey, um, in the 80s, that was named one of the most uh, economically devastated and violent cities in the country. I wanted to know what it meant to be um, and what, what the sort of world was of a young child who grows up to understand themselves based on all those conditions. But by the time I finished the book, it was clear to me that the story really wasn't about me trying to figure out what my becoming was. The real story that I was trying to figure out, or the lesson that I learned, was what it means to unbecome, or the power of unbecoming. And I want to sit with that. Um, so much of what I thought I would figure out by the time I finished the book was what it meant for me to have survived um, as a child who was very inquisitive, as a child who defied various norms, as a child who had lots of questions as a child who was being socialized or taught to understand himself, themselves moving in the world in a certain type of way. And by the time I was done, it was clear to me that the way that I found freedom, or what I call self-actualization, or what I might call the ability to look in the mirror and love every facet of a self that's peering at you on your reflection back, was because I was unafraid at some points to fail. There's a book you should know that was written by a scholar named Jack Halberstam that's called The Queer Art of Failure. Everyone should read it. Because what it does, it asks of us to consider what it means to see failure as a mode to success. Failure as a mode to freedom. Failure as a mode to self-actualization. A little bit about the book title that may help you understand my point. The title of the book, No Ashes in a Fire, comes from a moment when I was 14 years old. Um, I was a quirky, ch I mean, you can see, look at me, look how I'm dressed. You can imagine that when I was a kid, I totally defied whatever the norms were for boys to be dressing like, black boys from the hood, to be dressing like in the 80s and 90s. Everybody was wearing baggy pants, big shirts, cross-color outfits, and I had on church clothes, is what they called them, <laughs> which meant my pants were very tight. <laughs> and I had on shoes, long trench coats. I didn't play sports with the boys. One, not because I wasn't assertive and did not want to win. I could not see the ball because my glasses were very thick. <laughs> I played with the girls in the family. We played things like school and actually played a game called church. Do y'all know, I mean, am I making this, do y'all get what? And I love that type of shit. <laughs> I didn't want to be wrestled down with the boys outside. I didn't want to get dirty. But what that meant, because I was defying these norms, I was failing at these norms, is that I was picked on a lot. So one time I was walking home from the store with my grandmom's requisite peppermints. She would make me go to the store and get her 50 round peppermints. <laughs> Embarrassing for a 14-year-old child to have the person count those peppermints at the, it was just a mess. But I would do it, and I'm coming back from the store, and I'm walking with grandma's peppermints. On my way to the house, I'm surrounded by some neighborhood boys, one of whom was my, was my actual neighbor. The others lived in close proximity. 
And they picked on me all the time because of the way I dressed, because of the things I refused to do, because of my failure to be the type of boy they understood boys to be. And they jumped me, swung, hitting me in my face. And one of them, as he was hitting me, had a, a um, gallon of gasoline. The gasoline was contained in a milk carton. Took the top off, emptied it on me, and tried to light a match. But the match wouldn't light. The wind kept knocking it out. You know, I was a church boy, so when I was young, I kept saying nothing but God, right? It was God, but it was also my aunt who jumped in. I won't tell you what she did to the boys, but let's just say I made it out safely. So the book is a nod to that moment, to this moment where there should have and could have been a fire and a body that could have become ashes, but because of the intervention of either spirit and my Aunt Barbara, I managed to survive. It's a metaphor of actually what it means to be black in a country where black folk have always been under the conditions of fire, if you know what I mean, but somehow survive. The other thing that I want to say from the book is that it was an exploration of not just my childhood, but my father's becoming. My father, who I had a very complicated relationship with, my father who died while I was writing the book, my father who had me at 15, my mom was 16, a father who understood that manhood and the production of boyhood was to show that one has power, prowess, both physically, sexually, or whatever else. And he was a person who I watched harm and brutalize my mother a lot. Intimate partner violence was a big part of what my coming up was about. And for the longest time, I hated him. For the longest time, my determination was not to be the type of man that he was, not to exhibit the, the behaviors that he exhibited, not to put a foot on, mama's, on, a, on a woman's neck. And I mean that literally. Not to throw a woman into the snow as she's trying to help her sister. Not to say things like, I'm going to kill her in front of the kids that you both are raising. But then as I'm writing, I'm thinking, OK, how did he come to know what he knows? He was a boy child. He had me at 15. Mom was 16. He stopped going to school in eighth grade. Who taught him to be or to, to become or to understand what he did about boyhood and manhood? How does a child who at 15, whose nickname is given to him is Sweet Daddy, come to understand his role in the world, in the house, in the streets? That's, that nickname was attributed to him. And what it allowed me to do was to sort of take a, a deep dive, or at least have a more empathic view of his becoming. On one sense, this first story I told you is where I'm attacked is a sort of example of what it means when, when failure, when we choose to fail or not acquiesce to norms and people violate you or victimize you in response to that. You know how this goes. You ain't straight, you're queer. <laughs> Majority culture's got a problem with it and they tend to act out on it, right? You know how this goes. You're sort of gender non-conforming. You're not fitting the, the sort of mode that people think you should behave in and people respond. So on one hand, Failure can produce violence, but that violence is only produced because of the potential power in failure or the freedom that's present there. On the other hand, I think about my father's story, who, because he acquiesced to these ideas, to the norms, harmed so many people. Acquiescence, acquiescence to understandings of boyhood and manhood can do harm. My mom was a recipient of that harm. So I guess my point is, is as we're having all of these conversations in this moment, and we've been having them for years, Tarana with Me Too has been having them for many years as well, and all of those in the orbit, are we asking the right questions? Is it that I'm being asked to be a more healthy man or produce a sort of healthier or perform a healthier masculinity? our manhood, or should we be asking what, uh, what might it mean to allow people to fail at those ideas altogether? Or another way to think, what would it mean to abolish 
to get rid of, to remind people that it's OK to not fit into boxes that were never meant for your freedom. Now, I get it. Manhood, boyhood are social, social constructions. They are social facts. That means they are real, because we make them real. I like to call them real fictions. And I get that we got to attend to them because of the ways that they produce not just ideologies, but actual material um, consequences in the world. But I'm not trying to be a better man. I'm not trying to fit into a box that caused, wreaked havoc on me as a child growing up. I think, you know, it had, maybe this is the magic of queerness. And for those of us who need to understand what that means, we have some lessons, I think, to apply to the work within this field from queer and gender nonconforming folk. Jose Muniz says queerness is what he might define as the not yet here. Think about that. How, if, what if we ask a different sort of questions, not how, you know, not people, Darnell, what, what does it take to be a better man? I'm like, I just want to be a better human. Because all my damn life, I tried to fit into this box that you all call manhood, and that box is tight. And that box was really never meant for me, especially as a black, queer, gender non-conforming, oftentimes person. A box that is really founded upon principles of white supremacist, capitalist, cis, cis heteropatriarchy. Yeah. Kudos to Bell Hooks for those words. You have to understand that black folk, didn't, we, we weren't even allowed the category of manhood or humanity in the first place. So what might it mean to fail? To make space for failure, to resist, to push back, to abolish. And when I talk about abolition, a geographer, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, defines abolition not just as the raising of the things that don't work. It's about imagining what needs to go in the place of the shit that doesn't work. So I just don't believe in abolishing the cage, you know, abolishing the cage that is the prison. Uh -huh. It's a metaphor. I do believe in abolishing a cage that is a prison. And for so many, these cages of manhood and masculinity and boyhood are actually that. So I challenge all of us in a moment like this to think about how we might move beyond the shit that ain't been working for us. The ideas, the boxes, the categories, the definitions, the ways of being that have been too tight, that have not allowed us to breathe, that have not allowed us to be free and then to turn our work on its head so we can be in real-time conversation with folk who are imagining future ways of being far beyond what we have yet to see or experience. Thanks.